In this lecture, we're going to get towards the analytical or formulaic uh, definition and representation of a derivative. But to get there, let's do a couple more examples to get a feel for how it's different from the average rate of change and what types of things we need to think about when computing the actual derivative. So here, I have the data for the population of British Columbia from the censuses, census of the years 2001 until 2016. So the first part is asking, what is the average rate of population growth between years 2001 and 2016? The average means that I am going to be taking the points at 2016 and calculating the slope of a secant line between that and the point at 2001. So overall, the average rate of change of the population is going to be equal to the population um, values in the year 2016 minus the population values in the year 2001 divided by the difference in the time span, so the difference between the two years. So now if I plug in the corresponding numbers, so 4.6 and so on million for the population of 2016 and 3.9 and so on million for the population of 2001, my approximate calculations will give me about 49,354. Now, what are my units here? The top is population, which is in the number of people, and the bottom is in years. So this is people per year. Now, I can actually sketch the little graph of what this information represents. So on my y-axis, I'm going to have population, and on my x-axis, I'm going to have time. So if I'm looking between the years 2001 and 2016, what this currently gives me is, of course, the slope of this secant line. Okay, so this right here, the slope is the average at 49,354 people per year growth. Now, the next part asks to approximate the derivative in 2011. So that means I am now after the instantaneous rate of change in this particular point in time. So I am not actually interested in the average between two points. I'm interested in the instantaneous rate of change in the year 2011. So my year 2011 is here. Now, normally, I would like to be as close as possible for an instantaneous rate of change to the point in time that I am given. So if at all possible, it would have been nice to, for example, have the data for the beginning in 2011 and the end of 2011 so that I can then calculate a one year span for this instantaneous rate of change. Unfortunately, though, my data is not conducive to this kind of calculation. I don't have such precise and such granular data points. All I have are the points two years apart. So I'm kind of stuck. I get to decide whether to use the five previous years or the five following years, because the five years here seems to be the smallest probable um, time around 2011. Just for the sake of the argument, I'm actually going to use the 10 years around from 2006 to 2016 and then see what that gives me. So I'm going to calculate it between 2016 and 2006 and then see how this number actually compares to my average between 2001 and 2016. So one of my points is actually the same. Now, if I plug in these numbers, I'm going to end up with 53,456. And the units are as before, people per year. Now, if I am to now graph this information, I was looking for the instantaneous rate of change at 2011, but again, I can't get that kind of information from my data. The best I can do is approximate using nearby points. And I chose points that were five years apart into each direction from 2011. So now what I have here is, of course, not a slope of a tangent line, but still a slope of a secant line that is approximating my instantaneous rate of change. And I'm going between year 2006 to 2016. So I am starting at a year 2006, so five years after here. And I'm starting at a point higher than 
um, at a point of 2001. So let's say somewhere here. And notice that, of course, I'm still computing with 2016. So the slope of the line that I'm computing with will end in the exact same point um, that in the first part of my question. So the slope of this line here is 53,456 people per year. Note that my very rough graphic actually supports my calculations because this line is steeper than this one, and we can see that the slope of it is bigger than the first one. However, we fully understand that this is not an instantaneous rate of change. This is still the average, it's just computed around the numbers that are closer to 2011. Can we do better? Well, not really that much better with this particular data because I do have five-year intervals that I'm working with. But if I have a formula for a function that I'm working with, then I can pick how close I want to be and where do I want to compute um, the two points that I'm averaging in between for the instantaneous rate of change. So here's the formula for the exact same function that we've seen before. This formula describes, we've seen the graph before, the femur length of a, of a fetus of HT in weeks. We're asked to approximate the instantaneous rate of growth in 20 weeks. So there's essentially two ways of doing so. First of all, we can use the graph and get it directly from the graph as an approximation. And second of all, because we have a formula, we can pick two numbers around the week 20 and use the formula to actually approximate the result. Let's do the graph first. So in order for me to approximate it in the graph, I have to plot the point in week 20, here you go, and then draw a tangent line to that curve at this point. So drawing the tangent line here, let's say I end up with something like this. Okay, that wasn't really great. I mean, no tangent line is gonna really be like that precise. I'm gonna have to give up and just assume that this is um, good enough. Now, the instantaneous rate of change is the slope of the tangent line, which means that all I have to do at this point is to actually approximate the slope of this line. I already have this point right here that I can say is like week 20 and maybe um, millim in millimeters, something just above 20, uh, just above 30. And I get to pick a second point on this line because I actually want to calculate the slope, right? So let's say that my second point on this line is gonna be, well, this point happened to actually hit the grid point. So let's say that it happens to be right here. When I calculate the slope between these two points, rise over run, I should get an approximation. So my rough estimate here gives about 2.5. And what are the units? Well, I am doing rise, which then measures millimeters, over run, which will measure in weeks. So millimeters per week. So that means that in 20 weeks, the femur length is growing at the rate of approximately 2.5 millimeters per week. Now, this is the way that we do so graphically. If we were to approach this algebraically and take the formula, for now, we can pick the two numbers around week 20. So for example, I can pick 19 and 20, or I can pick you know, 19.9 and 20.1 and then calculate the average that way. They will give me two different averages that both approximate the instantaneous rate of femur growth in 20 weeks. So for the first one, so let's say average rate of change, so I'm going to take the two points that are a little bit further apart, right? So let's say 19 and 20. So the length at 20 minus the length at 19 divided by 20 minus 19, and then calculate this number. I can then also perform the exact same calculation, but take two points that are closer. So 20.1 and 19.9 and calculate the numbers in between those and that would provide me yet a different approximation of my instantaneous rate of change. Both of them are still going to be averages between the two points chosen. However, I also know that this function is nice and continuous. So whatever I get as an approximation between the two should be fairly close to the true instantaneous rate value because my function 
I know being the growth function doesn't exhibit sudden huge jumps between such close points in time. So while this will both produce approximations, they will be fairly decent approximations of the situation. Now, in terms of general interpretations of derivatives, let's think about contextual meaning of uh, various situations. So let's say I have a function h of t that gives me the height at time t of water at a dam. Okay, think about that setup. I have water at a dam. The height of it is given to me by this function. The units of t are hours, let's say maybe after midnight, and the units of h are meters in terms of height. And the two questions here are to come up with a physical interpretation of the slope of a secant line and to come up with a physical interpretation of the slope of a tangent line. Okay, so physical meaning in terms of the actual setup. Pause the video right here and write a sentence for each one of these to represent what it means to have the secant line between the two given points and the tangent line between uh, or at one of the points for this particular function. Okay, so it should be no surprise anymore that the secant line represents the average rate of change and the tangent line represents the instantaneous rate of change. I write these so often I should have made like a little stamp to just have the handwriting produced for me. So if I'm computing the average, I need two points. If I'm computing the instantaneous, I only need one point. So in terms of the average, we are taking the average between these two points. So this first part is the average. So the slope of the secant line is the average rate of change now, what is actually changing? The changing occurs in the height of the water. So of height of water at the dam between 0 and 24. So in a 24-hour period, some 24-hour period. So let's say 24-hour period. Now here, it doesn't actually even matter whether zero represents midnight or something like that. I am actually going full 24 hours. So there we are. And of course, the units of the height here are going to be meters. For the second question, for the tangent line, we have that it's instantaneous, instantaneous rate of change of the height of water. And at what time we're doing this? Well, we are only given the one point in time, and that point in time is zero. So at time zero. So here, because it's instantaneous, it will tell us immediately whether the water height is rising or falling and how fast it is doing so, right? So how fast water is rising or falling exactly at time t equals zero. The average will only tell us what happens over 24 hour period. Here, we know exactly what the water is doing at that very specific point in time. So uh, this is another example of a application that we've seen before, Meltic Arctic Sea Ice. It's the exact same thing as uh, what was given to us before with the graph, but here now we actually have a analytical, a function and description of it. Okay, I encourage you to pause it here and go through this question yourself. There is really nothing to it um, that we have not yet seen. So the average rate of change between 1980 and 2000. Now remember that this corresponded to, and I forgot to mention this in this question, where t is zero at the year 1980, okay? So the year 1980 corresponds to time zero, and therefore the year 2000 corresponds to time 20. Now, the average rate of change will, of course, be computing between the actual um, C am uh, ice amount between the two years divided by the time span that occurred between the two years. And so if I plug those numbers in, into the formula, 20 goes into the formula, I calculate the value, 0 goes into the formula, I calculate the value, 
subtract them from each other, divide by 20, I'm going to get minus 0 0.057. And the units are going to be the units of S divided by the units of T. So millions of square kilometers divided by years. So divided by the year. Once again, notice that this is totally fine to be negative. And what that really means is that the amount of ice is decreasing. The average rate of change is negative. So that means that the slope of the secant line is um, negative and therefore the overall function, um, function behavior will be a decreasing one. Next up, approximating S prime of 20. So the question is, as before, how close can we go to this particular number? I don't yet, again, have um, analytic techniques, really. We're going to get to it towards the end of this lecture of actually computing the, um, the function's derivative exactly at the point. So here, all I'm wondering is how close can we go to zero and compute the average? So how low, close can you go? So let's say that I am going to approximate the derivative at 20 as, okay, let me make it clear, oops, that it's an approximation, not the exact value. So approximately the average rate of change. And I'm going to pick two points that are very close to 20. So I'm going to pick, let's say, 19.9 and 20.1. And then once I do that, it's nothing but the actual average. So I'm going to take the point at 20.1, subtract the value at 19.9, and then divide by the two um, by the t period of the time that went in between these two. So overall, my answer is going to be minus 0.137. And the units, of course, are the same as before. So millions of square kilometers per year. Okay, and once again, we're seeing the exact same behavior. This is negative, which means that overall, the function is certainly decreasing. So the amount of ice on the North and South Pole is decreasing overall. Something really must be done. Okay, nothing new here the average rate of change and then approximation of the instantaneous rate of change by taking two points that are close together to compute an approximation of the average okay one final example of an application here we're going to talk about cooling laws or in particular um, this formula that describes the temperature of a pie taken out of the oven where t is degrees in celsius big T, and little t is time in minutes, okay? And this question has quite a few parts. Once again, nothing we haven't seen before. So pause the video and do this yourself. If we were in a live class, this is where I would stop talking and I would give you five to 10 minutes to try this out for yourself um, before going through the answers together. All right, so what is the pie's initial temperature? Well, pie is taken out of the oven, and in T minutes, its temperature is given by this. So that means that the initial temperature corresponds to the temperature in zero minutes. And I can simply plug zero into the formula to compute that. If I plug zero in here, what am I going to get? Well, let me write this out. 0 0.005 times zero minus 100 squared plus 35. I can compute this, of course, as a number. I'm going to end up with 85 degrees, and these are in Celsius, as they should be. Approximate T prime of 20 and clearly state the units. So, same as before, I am going to approximate the derivative as the average between the two points. So, average rate of change, and I get to decide how close I would like to be. And so, let's say in this case, I'm going to go between 19 and 21. Okay, I'm going to plug in those two values in for temperature and calculate the overall result. Now, before we do that, let's establish an expectation of what we expect the answer to be. So my pie is taken out of the oven, and this is the temperature that describes the process that happens to the pie afterwards. So if you take pie out of the oven, you probably take it into a room temperature environment, which means that the pie will be cooling down. 
So I do expect a negative number here as the answer because the rate of change of the temperature should be decreasing. And indeed, that is what happens. So the number that I get here is minus 0.8. What are my units? The units on the top are degrees Celsius. The units on the bottom are in minutes. So that means that in 20 minutes, and I can write this down as an actual sentence, the pi is, first of all, cooling down. We can see that by the decrease, uh, by the negative um, rate of change. So in 20 minutes, pi is cooling down. And how fast is it cooling down? At the rate of 0.8 degrees Celsius per minute. Okay, if I'm already saying that it's cooling down, I no longer need to actually include the negative. Okay, now what else do we have here? We're asked to confirm part A answer using the graph. Okay, so part A answer was the fact that the initial temperature of the pi was 85 degrees. Initial temperature corresponds to T being zero. So I'm looking at zero and I'm looking at this point right here. Indeed, nothing too surprising. This seems to be at 85 degrees up here. Next up, we're asked a more um, reasonable, not reasonable, what's the right word? Um, a more interesting, let's say, question. What trend do you see in the derivative as t increases from zero to 80? So from zero to 80, now remember this is in minutes, so this is as time goes on, and we're asked to see what trend in the derivative do we see and explain it in terms of the context. So derivative, unsurprisingly, once again, it's going to come up again and again, derivative is the slope of the tangent line, which means that I can think about what happens to the slope of the tangent line between point 0 and 80. So let's say near the beginning I draw the tangent line. At some point it's going to look like this. And if I draw it at 80, it's going to look like this. So what I do notice is that the derivative is actually getting less and less steep. And that also actually makes sense in terms of the contest, context. In the beginning, the pi is cooling down at a certain rate, and as it cools down and approaches the room temperature, it's going to still cool down, but cool down less fast. Okay, And that's exactly the idea here, is that the pi continues to cool down, but it does so less fast. Now, it's important to also note the difference between the fact that the slope here is still negative across all of the time values where we're interested, right? So the pi was cooling down here because the slope was negative, and the pi is still cooling down here because the slope is still negative. But the slope is much less negative here than it was up here, which is why we can say that it still cools down but less fast than before. And I should probably, if I'm going to be comprehensive about answering this, actually answer the first part of the question. What trend do you see in the derivative? Derivative is getting less negative. Okay, so it's still negative, but less negative as time goes on. Using the graph, estimate the rate of change of Turkey's temperature happened here, pi's temperature, in an hour. Okay, I was thinking Thanksgiving, and apparently I was thinking of different dishes at Thanksgiving and not consistently the same one. So, in an hour means I am looking at 60 minutes. So the rate of change of Turkey in an hour, meaning I'm not given two points here, I'm not asked over the first hour or something like that. If it's in an hour, I am looking at instantaneous rate of change in 60 minutes. Now, I can use the formula from the previous slide to do that, or I can use the actual graph to do that as well. So let's do the graph because I'm already on this slide and um, I might as well be drawing things right up here, right? So in 60 minutes, I am looking at this point right here. 
and I'm drawing a tangent line to the curve at this point, and then I'm going to take and approximate its slope using the points on the graph that I see. So if I am gonna draw a tangent line here, maybe it's something that looks like this. Okay, and it doesn't quite go through the point, but close enough, something that looks like this, right? And again, approximating the actual points from the graph means that I have to look for the points on this particular line. So let's say I can take this point right here and I can approximate it to be 40 and 50. So this point I can say is 40, 50. And then I can take, let's say, this point and approximate it, just because I want some sort of round numbers, it's already an approximation. I can approximate it to be 75 and 35. Okay, I can actually, once again, do a little bit better because I do have a formula for this function on the previous page, and I can plug in points that are closer to 60 for it, but I just wanted to do yet another different approach to that. So this is going to be approximately the rise between these two points, so the difference in the y-coordinates, divided by the run, so the difference in the x-coordinates, which will turn out to be minus 0.43, and the units are still going to be degrees Celsius per minute. So that means that in an hour, the pi is cooling down at the rate of minus 0.43 Celsius, a degree Celsius per minute. All right, so this is what we do when we are approximating the derivative values from the graphs or from the functions, but using the average as the approximation technique. However, now that we have already familiarized ourselves with um, limits and we recall the limit definition of the derivative that involves limits and the function itself, we can actually find the exact value of the derivative analytically, so using the formula. I didn't want to do this with any of the applications because, as you've noticed, in the applications the functions are quite bulky and tend to have not very easy to work with coefficients. So the first example we're going to do is going to be with a nice, easy linear function, 5x. So what I have to do is actually calculate this giant limit expression for the function 5x. Okay. I'm actually going to rewrite it fully um, and then substitute pieces of it using my new function. So I have f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Now, my function is 5x. So this is what's going to go in for this piece right here. So this piece right here is just 5x. However, the first portion, portion of the top here is f of x plus h. So I need to figure out what that is given my functional expression. This, I've warned you of this before, you got to be careful. You have to actually use x plus h everywhere you see x. Okay, so we are substituting x plus h in for x everywhere, the entire thing. So overall, I'm going to have 5 times my new value for the function that I'm plugging in, which is x plus h. Be very careful because the mistake that students do all the time is to instead replace x with x plus h and then forget about brackets. So what happens a lot is this expression, which of course is not the same as the first one. So my f of x plus h is actually going to be 5 times x plus h. And now that I have both of these, let me plug them in and see if I can simplify something. So this can be replaced by 5 times x plus h minus, and this f of x can be replaced with simply 5x, and I'm going to take this all over h. Well, that's good news. At least I don't have f's all over the place. Function notation has gone. And now I just have to simplify the resulting expression. So first things first, I'm going to open up the brackets here. Remember that unless I've already computed the limit, I cannot get rid of it yet. So I have to carry it over with me. So I have 5x plus 5h from the first part here. And then minus 5x all over h. I, of course, notice that 5x and 5x cancel each other out. And so in the next step, 
I can have limit. Again, I haven't computed yet, so I have to carry it over. The only thing that's left on top is 5H, and the one thing that's left on the bottom is H. And now I can see that I can actually cancel H's out because they're now factors of bo both top and bottom. So overall, my limit becomes limit of 5. And we remember from the limit laws a while back that a limit of a constant is always just a constant itself, so 5. So let's gather up all the information that we've managed to deduce here. I have that the derivative through a series of long and kind of annoying computations turned out to be just 5. Now remember, the derivative depends on the function, and the function in our case was 5x. So that means that the derivative of 5x is 5. Now this is a little bit surprising because 5 is just a number, but let's think about what this function of ours, 5x, was to begin with. So if I do a sketch here, the function 5x that we started with, of course, is just a line. It's a line of slope 5, right? We know that from pre-calculus. And remember that the derivative is the slope of a tangent line to my function. Now, if my, if my function itself is a line, then the tangent line to it is just itself. So the derivative here will just be the line itself, the slope of it being 5. So it's really not surprising that the slope is a constant. However, it can only be so for actual lines, for linear functions. The slope of a line is always a constant, and therefore its derivative will also always be constant. Let's see how this works out for a quadratic function, x squared. Method is going to be exactly the same. All we're doing is plugging this function in to our definition of the derivative. And that's why it says persevere is because sometimes the calculations are going to be quite lengthy. So remember that first of all, all I'm trying to do is replace all of the existing um, functional notations in this limit with what my function actually is at those different points, and specifically at x and at x plus h. It's exactly the same method as the one on the previous slide. Plug this in into the two functions properly and then simplify. So pause the video. Watching me do it one more time isn't going to teach you as much as doing it yourself and seeing how to proceed. So my f of x is simply x squared in this case, but what about my f of x plus h? Again, this is where a lot of mistakes occur. Make sure that you replace this entire thing uh, you replace x with this entire thing. So you have to plug in this whole thing in where x was. And so this will give you x plus h all squared, which is what you have to replace this um, expression with. And of course, while I have not evaluated the limit, I'm going to have to rewrite the limit. So now I have these two expressions with the minus in between on top. So x plus h squared minus x squared all over h. And now we're just going to have to open up the brackets here and compute within here. This is another place where lots of mistakes usually get made is this particular expression. You don't just blop the square on top of each of the terms. You actually have to properly open up the brackets. So if you don't remember how to do this quickly, simply multiply the bracket by itself. That is what being a square is, and then FOIL it out so you see that you don't just get x squared and h squared, but you will get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then of course your minus x squared term from over here and all divided by h. x squares will cancel. And what are we going to have left? We are going to have 2xh plus h squared all over h. So I noticed that I still can't plug in h equals 0 because this will cause me to have 0 on the bottom. And so my hope is that I can factor out the h from the top so I can actually cancel them out. So if I factor out h from the top, I'm going to have 2x plus h left in the brackets divided by h. Now that it's a factor of both top and bottom, I can cancel it out. And happily, I no longer have a denominator, 
which means I can simply plug in h equals 0 into the expression. This part will go away and 2x will stay. So overall, my answer is going to be 2x. So that means that for the function f of x being x squared, we have that the derivative f prime of x is equal to 2x. And so notice the difference between the last slide and this one. Last slide, our derivative was a constant, 5, because our line was, uh, our function was a line and therefore had constant slope. Now that our function is a parabola, our derivative is 2x. So our derivative depends on the point at which I'm calculating the derivative. And this, of course, also makes sense if you draw yourself a quick sketch of the function that we are considering. We are considering a parabola, x squared. So here's my rough sketch of it. Oh, it's not that bad. Thinking of the actual derivative of it is thinking about the tangent lines. If I draw a tangent line at 0 here, the slope of it is going to be 0, which if I plug in x equals 0, I will see actually checks out. But if I draw a tangent line up here, the slope of it is going to not be 0 anymore. It's going to be some positive number. And in fact, it's going to be whatever value I plugged in, the slope of it is going to be twice that. If I plug in, if I think of the tangent line somewhere on the negative side, then the slope is going to be negative, which again corresponds to what my expression is. On the parabola, the different points will give me different values of the derivative. So depending on where my derivative is calculated, the value of it is not going to be the same. Now, I know that this process is long and tedious, but it is very important to, first of all, grow your understanding of the derivative as the rate of change of a function where the two points between which you're computing the averages are getting instantaneously close to infinitely close to each other. And secondly, um, it is important to sort of go through the motions of uh, algebraic manipulations because we will be doing a lot of them in other contexts. So there is another page in your notes that allows you to practice more with this definition of the derivative with different functions. Go through this, get your hand sort of mechanically used to plugging in for the function notation and then computing the corresponding limit. And also make sure that your computation match your geometric understanding.